true thing filters will build up biomass. And one of the nice advantages of putting the of a column in front of it is it does knock the DOD5 down from around 120 or not, down to 80 or so milligrams per liter. And that minimizes the amount of biofilm growth you get in the reactor, therefore it sort of minimizes the amount of total suspended solids in the system. That really eases up the work on the true thing filter to clarify it. And so their simple designs are pretty darn effective. And in seven hours, that's a pretty good rate. It's, a pretty good, it's not as nearly as fast as you can get through the these sludge systems, but you don't have to do any aeration except just by a basic small fan. With that work, we went through a big design where we actually made a base unit of uh, a base volume of 25,000 gallons, and we did this to where we then scaled up how many, what kind of, how many of these units would we need to replace the activated sludge beds down at the Hawaii Kai, and then we tried to calculate how much energy we need for each one of these units. We had we worked out what the actual uh, load would be for the pump and the aeration. And we went through uh, an energy balance all the way through what it would take to replace the plant. So here's the basic scale of the plant. They actually have the primary clarifiers that go through aeration basins. They have the clarifier and they go through UV. We, for about the same size, all of our units would move like that. They would just go to a large sand filter. And you might take it in UV before you go out and discharge. But what we found was we could basically meet their effluent for half the energy. Capital costs are not compared just as of yet, but for the energy savings, we're about 48% of the energy consumption. So you can do it. And it's a, it's a viable system. Uh, you, may not, you, may, you could do that in Sand Island, for example, in, in compliance if you want to. It could go this route, but it does work. There's a whole lot of other factors in the analyze whether this is the system versus others, but that's Now, where I'm now going further in my lab is I've gone back into my lab and I've rebuilt the system to mimic what was at Hawaii Kai. So um, I've now built in my lab, rather than having two anaerobic columns, I have an anaerobic column and I have an aeration treatment filter column. And my goal is to treat, right now we're treating high strength wastewater, the grease trap wastewater from the city of Lavisa. And we're going through the mixing tank, the anaerobic column, and we're going into the trickling filter and the anaerobic biochar filter here. And in the back, we've got a little holding tank. The water going through the whole, there's a big recycle loop on these reactors. But after the biochar filter, we go to take the water in the holding tank. And it's hard to see, but if you go down to the lab right now and look at it, you'll see that the water that we actually are producing now is clear. And it's got the Virtually no solids, and um, we're below the uh, EPA on um, the uh, BOD. You got to be a little careful about how you you know have the outlet coming in the treatment filter because you don't want to over flood it with, with high strength wastewater. So you know we have we are going at a much lower HRT now. In two days it's now about five to seven, and I am now working on packing materials that are even better than the biochar. It's a new way to bring biochar. Putting biochar in bedding in the thin films and other polymer material so we can get more surface area. So I can make these things work in a much faster way. This wastewater is we're bringing it up now and we're connecting it to a hydroponics system where we're actually going through aeroponics, not hydroponics. We're actually watering the woods. We don't flood them, we actually spray them. And we're designing ways to actually grow energy crops off of this wastewater. And the idea is to have a completely closed system. So you only lose water through. Although, again, you don't have to worry about the nutrients not having to build it up anymore. Every wastewater stream is different in terms of what it has as ions and so forth. You know, uh, we find that this water is very high in salt, sodium chloride, for example. We're not sure whether that's because it's food and people pour salt into the food, or whether it's because all the grease trap wastes are actually stuck down in the ground that are rotted and they're, you know, oops, uh, there's salt water. So, you know, we're wondering about that. But uh, by and large, the system works very good in taking, um, the, one of the nice things is it does not really, because we're lowering the, 
because most of the carbon is being consumed and converted to gas in this reactor, we're not taking a lot, we're not producing a lot of biomass. It's very small amount of salt being produced. That means we're not really taking up much of the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because this is treated water still rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. So we can use that to cultivate the plants. For the moment, we have a UV light in here, but my goal is to remove it and have, find a natural balance between nitrogen and soil. So we're, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're finding the ACV reduction of 99.2%, TSS of 99.8%. This combination of anaerobic aerobic is really, really good. And uh, we just published, we submitted the first paper on the anaerobic and the collective on the aerobic, and then eventually get around to it. Where Kevin and uh, Candy's lab has designed ways to grow the plants with no, uh, I say soilless, but I'm supposed to say media, support media less. Support media less. We're just trying to grow just the plants in the tube with nothing else, just for those which will be very good if you go build these things into greenhouses next to wastewater treatment facilities or wherever there's wastewater. Because if you don't have to have any media for those plants, we have a big top up there that blocks any spray from going out. And we're working with Greg Stern and, and Craig Nelson to develop ways to actually we're going to be tracking viruses and bacterial pathogens and all the fruits and all the leaves to try to prove that this is actually a significant area. They try to come up with a way to do greenhouses. So they don't have to use any um, support media, and it's just tubes. It makes it a lot simpler to achieve. This is just a picture of um, to show that both organic acids are just completely consumed and they're gone by the time we get the end of the reactor. This is interesting because we don't have any smell in our reactor. And the smell is not H2S, the smell is coming from these both so if you've got a system where your both organic gases are being taken down almost completely, you don't really, really have any gas smells. That's the same. So talking about my future work and how I'm changing packing materials, is what I'm trying to do is I'm the biochar works very good, but you put in big chunks of the reactor that take on awful glass reactor space. And even though they have phenomenal biofilm surfaces. Too much, I'm losing way too much reactor space. So I'm trying to go down, and you know, I'm talking, think about reactors like five, six thousand gallons. Big. So you know, even when you put in pieces, this or six bit, you lose an awful lot of reactor volume. So I'm trying to go down to much smaller pieces and suspend them in a biofilm, chitosan biofilm, which is a known inhibitor now to the growth of microbial films. We have a lot of SEM data showing that on these chitosan films. We get very, uh, very, very thin layers of bacteria that are all very spotty. And the theory here is that if we can actually space out the biochar, we get island biofilms, as opposed to a big coalescing biofilm across pack biofilm. And that's going to increase the surface area of the reactor. And that's the goal. And to find and, and, and to actually uh, find out how to manufacture the kind of thing in a film that allows the biochar to be in a way in which we can use standards and processing technology. About the final patent, and then we just basically load up and react to the <coughs> Hopefully, we're going to be doing these tests this year. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions? I hope that was <coughs> Yes? Uh, what's this bio chart? soils that was made from sewer sludge. It's basically organic material. In the reactors, the biochar we use is mixed with waste mixed woods, spruce, pine, and maple. So that's the um, has lost 40%, and it's, it's probably lost 60% of its matter through the biochar process, so it's very, it's not roll time And you usually want to rinse it a little bit, get rid of some of the Uh, of, of, of this system? 
the one in the previous one where you use the it's our hybrid. On the high system. Sorry. This was the one down the white hat. Oh, right hat. Is this one here? Yeah. What was the velocity? Don't know. Um, sounds sort of. The reality of this, and we had to actually pack this in, you know, you're climbing up on ladders, this top is over by a crane, and you actually have to load all this thing in there. And the, uh, this packing material there was put into uh, discs that were already, they're, they're little bands right there, they're already like a disc of net that had been packed by this gentleman. This is that you have some kind of uh, mass on the top. What kind of a mass? The mass, some kind of a net on the top. Okay, so this this was the right, this is the filamentous uh, bioness material that was done by. <coughs> and it's a thin filamentous, and that was back pretty tight. Then, and that's enclosed in a big uh, net that is actually anchored into the side through branches. Uh, that's anchored. I just took some eye out. Sorry about that. And and this. Biochar was packed in, there was nets that were put across the big surface, and there's another film in this material plus all the biochar. And that net was placed over the top and buckets were bought up and it just kept pouring into it. And as it more and more poured into it, it actually started to fall down until it was finally tied off at the top. And then a whole other layer of biochar was just put on it, just poured in. And then another one of those nets that the filamentous. <clears throat> and that was attached to the flannels, and that's, what's, that's what held everything in, because the biochar will rise. And uh, uh, it actually creates an upward force, so that's one of the reasons why I'm moving towards not just using pure biochar, but I want to suspend it in the soil it becomes neutrally formed. We did notice that the sand island was a pretty strong upward force in the biochar. Did you see the microbes going into the mesopores inside the uh, Oh, so that's 20 micron scale, 20 microns across there, surface of the body char. Um, and this, by the way, was sliced, so that's why it was broken after it was broken. Mm -hmm. um, it's my basic assumption that you only get the macro surface of the biochar. Even if the bugs go into the nasal pores, I just don't think they're active. I don't think you get nutrient flow in these nasal pores and back out compared to the entire surface. And we're talking chunks of the The surfaces are just covered in this film. I just think that's where they actually I think that think you're getting extra surface area in those pores. To me, from a mass transfer point of view, and in order to gesture the biofilms, I think it's kind of fool's gold. I just don't see that working. Because you, you get a layer on top of the surface anyways, that's a thick coating of your biofilms, so who really cares about that doesn't work long there. If you're trying to take out gases, and the tablets and gas are right there, but we, you know, the, 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 the bugs themselves are something like Anyway, so what's the what's the reservoir do? It may absorb water, it may hold some gas, but I don't think that's any active surface area, so that's why I think you really gotta reduce down the size of the biochar pieces. In this context, if this is how you make this catalytic material. But you make it too small, you can't put it in a large scale reactor, so you really gotta encapsulate it in a large one. But I, answer, I didn't answer your question. That's that's my other question was the function of the line. I have too many questions because I wanted to know. Did you see any kind of organic matter being released by the biochar? Any kind of organic? Yeah, because you may have solo hydrolysis going on within the biochar, releasing organic matter in the process of degradation of the organic matter, or some poor metabolism kind of reaction. Oh, okay. So uh, we never looked at it at that scale. <coughs> The dominant part of our measurements was 0.1. So 
over system operations? And if you're, it's a good question, and I get what you're getting at, because um, not all biochars are totally inert. I, I get what you're getting at, and why. Um, but if you're dealing with some of that 600 gallons down there, and you're having stuff that's coming in at 20 pounds per liter at an industrial plant, you're really, I think whatever you're going to get out of the biochar is probably insignificant compared to what you're feeding in, like it's a small number versus a large number. Um, because we were going from like 20 grams per liter down to one gram per liter. So, okay. And they don't care. They just want to know what their effluent is because that's what they're going to get charged for, right? I think eventually what you're, what you're pointing at disappears. Whatever is there will eventually be degraded anyways. And if this stuff is the last five years or 10 years, okay, maybe in the beginning you have, um, you're not as efficient, your results don't look as efficient as it is because you're actually including in your calculations some organic matter that's being derived from your computer. But ultimately, the core part of the biochar is inert. So once you get to that, you're there. So I think your answer is yes, it's probably happening in the beginning. And it's a very interesting question. It's a pretty hard thing to measure experimentally, though. It takes, but it would be a hell of an experiment. I'll tell you that. I grant you that. Yeah. How, how firm are those biofilms? How thick? How firm are they attached to the biochar? Because you have an up, upward flow. Yeah. Well, and it kind of trickles to the second. Does it bring a little amount of biofilm to the, the second one? Okay, so um, first things first, though, really, is the context is, is uh, Dr. Sue's talking about um, are we getting a lot of sloughing in the biofilms because of both. So when you're talking about, let's say, a seven, even a seven hour HRT, the water is quiet, it's just basically going out, particularly large ones. There's nothing organic about it. There is nothing about the flow at best quiet, and it just only flows like this. Even when we put in recycle at, a, at the two or three times that flow rate going into the system, this does not work. Any way, shape, or form affects the biofilms. What I do think can start to affect the biofilms is the gasket, because that's a pretty strong upper force, the bigger the larger these reactors are. And um, but to answer your question, we um, down at Hawaii Kai can't really measure that too accurately because we have a trickling. And we found that over uh, five or six months, our clarifying samples were not being flooded with biofilms. Okay. But that's because it's there's a trick into it. That's a whole different beast than the other reactors. Down at Sand Island, I don't know, Ken, did you see significant biofilms? Absolutely not. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't we didn't see it. So I think these biofilms are pretty darn robust. The biochar itself is a pretty rough surface. I mean, that's one of, I'm from the field where it does not matter. You can manipulate surface chemistry all you want. I don't think it has much of an effect. I think surface roughness and having a carbon organic surface are the two biggest factors. And then when you've got a good porosity or good kind of surface roughness that you get in those biochar pieces, I think the biochar's are pretty nice You know, they survive in streams, they survive everywhere. In the so they don't get thick enough to slough. We did not see. Sand Island. Uh, we were, when we would look at the water going into the uh, effluent container, and we catch it in the container. It was colored, but it was not full of So I think it's pretty hardy, but we're not talking turbulent flow like the pipe or like that. I guess that was stuff. But I don't think industrially the water got that well. The gas might. Bigger, really, if you really went to like 25,000. So another aspect related to your biochar is you pointed out, you know, size-wise, you want to have large surface area for your biochar. So you're actually reducing the size of it. But I got to, I got to have it in something. You got to have like a polymer film that's actually like a pancake. We actually have a whole bunch of stuff. I wish I could. That's 
Well, that's the idea that I'm trying to make. But that film then has got to stand up in five years as well, right? It's got to stay so I want water not to grade. Uh, we think we're close to it. And that's based on Tyson, which is the cheapest bottle. Recycle the change the biochars in the step. I mean, okay, you put it once and it's good for never. No, I mean, it's if it's as long as it's inert, it doesn't. So, doesn't the material that's coating the biochars the build bottoms. up gradually and then the biofilms? Yeah, um, I mean, Do they die and have to be replaced. I mean, if there's a natural death process, there's a natural growth process, then okay. the biofilms are basically regenerative. Okay. They're like a living tissue. So they don't have a lifetime like a physical catalyst that has active surface activity. Okay, right. Okay. right. And, and anaerobic biofilms are, are well renowned for you can dry them up and then resuspend them in water and they go on and they okay. really renowned for that. Very hardy microbes. We're currently recycling any sloughing that we have in our laboratory system and it's simply being digested. All right. Yeah, that's that's a good point, I, I think. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'll show you a picture. All of our reactors are designed with a, with a cone at the bottom. And any solids or sloughing or biofilms that come down, we always are recycling. I, we're always recycling back to the mixing tank. And at large scale, one thing I didn't tell you is we put chopper motors at the bottom of this. The mixing and the the, the way we mix in this mixing tank is by fluid flow. We actually pump the water out the bottom and then pump it back in the top. And I do that because we go through what's basically a very grinder pumps. They're like garbage disposals. And they'll chew up any, any solids. So basically, the system has also been designed in the clarifier. They're, these are also, these reactors are kind of clarifiers. And the whole point is that the solids fall down and they go back to the mixing tank and they eventually get digested. That's another reason why we have low solids finally leaving because we are using gravity and the fluid flow is going through through here even at five to seven hours. It's, you know, if you wash the water flow it still goes like this. So the upward buoyant, the upward force of the fluid velocity is not overcoming the downward force of gravity. Unless it's you know a neutral buoyant material. But the biochar acts as a pretty good barrier. So we're you know, and if you, in food waste and stuff, the big scale, this is a big tank. The grinder pump down there was pretty, pretty significant. So we could put in bones and stuff. We just grind them. If you really wanted to build fats and stuff, that was kind of like not fats. Or the one weakness of this whole system, and it's a real weakness, is you can't have high oils, fats, oils, and greases, because they just go right to the top, and they form this big barrier at the top, and it's unlike anaerobic. If they're doing the eggshell type anaerobic reactors where they really have designed to mix the surface. We really can't put fog through here. We have to separate it. The wastewater's got to be kind of clean as a little increase. Otherwise, it just goes straight to the top and it's a like The gas going up just falls. It's very, it's a pain. And that's the one weakness is your wastewater cannot really be full of fog. That's what's increasing. You do have to separate. So this, these kind of systems are not good for bats and all those kind of systems. Wastewater, but it is, but not that. But you know, fats oils and greases are just a pain. Yes? Um, for the microbial community analysis, did you see the shift, like how the microbial community, the biofilm changed as? As the biofilm itself changed, we have not looked as the biofilms have grown. That just, is the agreed step. So the, the study was just done on a single day sample? It's a single day sample at the end of the run. So all of our community assessment was after we were done and we were ready to sacrifice the reactor, you know, take it apart and redesign it. Because all these things have been for 
redesigned four or five times, but we would wait until we knew we had a representative biofilm that we wanted to analyze because the biogas composition was very healthy, 65% that day. And we were getting near the theoretical maximum of gas production rate. So we would then stop and take a sample all the way through the systems. We would look at the biofilm communities throughout distance through the system. We've never looked at time as the biofilms have grown. Um, but, you know, and that's a tough study. I mean, that's, it's a good study. Can you please um, show me the slides where you show the relative abundance data? So, what is that MC01? Oh, okay. So, MC01 is a feedstock. That's a planktonic liquid culture. That's the grease trap waste wastewater. Okay? MCO2 is the mixing tank. So if I go back. Uh, the feedstock would be what's in that tank. The mixing tank would be what's in there. Right? So every 23 or 4 weeks, we had to take a whole bunch of wastewater from here and move it over to basically a feedstock tank, a holding tank. That's the feedstock. The feedstock gets pumped into the mixing tank. And the mixing tank is interacting with the rest of the reactor because we always have to recycle coming back. But there's no recycle going into the mixing tank. Right? Because we, we, we're not flowing water straight from this reactor into the reactor. We had to pump water in here this system was not connected to ours. We were basically tapping into it. Does that make sense so far? So in your project, are you more concerned about CO again beauty removal, or are you also planning to upgrade your biogas composition, like increase the methane composition? Um, we always want more methane, right? So um, what I would say is, on any given time, whether it's down there or it's in our reactor in our labs, we are pretty happily going between 62 and sometimes 68 percent methane. A couple of times we have it to 7 percent, and I've been very happy with that. But anything better than that would be great. If there were ideas on how to manipulate the biofilm communities to drive that, <coughs> absolutely worth doing. I'd so now we have. But so we have not tried. Manipulate the communities to do that. Okay, so for now, when you see the methanogens, you are not just analyzing which which type of methanogens is like dominant, or so you're not going deeper into the microbiome analysis. Um, right, we probably did not go as deep as you would have liked us to go. I can say that yeah. we certainly classify this methanogens. We're getting down to the actual individual, and, and, and I would love to do that. I'm more interested in the body. I, I agree. No, I, it's, it's a brave new world. I mean, we, the phylogenetic analysis, was, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's publishable. And it's, it gives significant detail, but no, we have not gotten into that. And I would love to do it. I'm um, happy to talk to you and put some funds into it. Because it's really worth doing. I would really like to do it on our new package. That would be, we're doing it this year, so if you've got an interest in it, then maybe we can find a way to uh, give you a system to collaborate on because the new packing material will really can manipulate a lot more things than we can in a big reactor. And we can control the tests a lot more. So I would love to get a much more detail. Is that it? Yeah. 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 So, if you have any more questions or queries or want to know more of research, you are always free to contact Dr. Kuni. And thank you, Dr. Kuni, for putting all this interesting work today. And thank you to everyone for coming over and listening.